ist die Zukunft des deutschen Volkes. Wenn wir selbst dieses deutsche Volk ein Vorführen durch eigene Arbeit, durch eigene Zeit, eigene Entschlossenheit, eigene Trotz, eigene Beharrlichkeit, dann werden wir wieder den Vorstein, genau wie die Väter einst aus Deutschland nicht das Geld erhielten, sondern uns selbst nicht schaffen mussten. Adolf Hitler, leader of the radical Nazi party, had gained great power in Germany by 1936. At this time there were no other political parties to oppose him, and he held complete power over Germany. His goal? To conquer Europe to provide living space for his people. Although Hitler had much resentment for the Western Allies, specifically France, his real goal was a drive to the East. He would spend the entire war trying to conquer the East. His military, rebuilt to become 7 million strong, led Germany to become equivalent to that of a superpower today. Yet the conquering of the East was not to be an easy task. On the other side of Europe lay Joseph Stalin, a man of paranoia and deceit. He was the dictator of the Soviet Union an industrial powerhouse by 1936 and the largest state in the world. His military, although 4 million strong, was technologically backward, possessing great amounts of artillery and tanks, yet lacking decisively in communication equipment, general organization and soldier training. This was to prove fatal in the years to come. By August 1939, Stalin was looking to greatly expand his sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, and so he bitterly signed a non-aggression pact with Germany, his greatest ideological enemy. Foreign Ministers Ribbentrop and Molotov signed the pact, which divided Poland into two and also gave the Baltic states to the Soviets. On September the 1st, 1939, after unreasonable territorial demands, the Nazis invaded Poland. Poland's defense plan soon crumbled into pieces, while the Soviets also invaded. Stalin seemed to have Europe firmly in his hands. He built up his industry, particularly in the Ural Mountains, while Germany defeated France and the Low Countries after they had just declared war on Germany. For Hitler, these victories seemed to ensure the might of the German army, that it was undefeatable. This would prove a fatal judgment at Stalingrad. These agreements could not last. In May 1940, Hitler was already planning his invasion of the Soviet Union. Millions of troops were involved on both sides. The German plan of attack formed was to unleash a blitzkrieg assault on the uncoordinated Soviets, with fierce assaults in their north, center, and south. Then, the second stage of the invasion would involve two assaults at both Moscow and Leningrad. No sooner after France was defeated that the German military preparations began. One million Romanian, Bulgarian, Hungarian and Spanish volunteers were to fight in the south, while three million German Wehrmacht troops were to invade the central and northern Soviet Union. The attack began without a declaration of war on June 22, 1941. Huge Soviet armies were quickly encircled. Stalin first refused to let them fight back in fear that the Germans would have reason to attack even further. This was a terrible mistake. The German advance was brutal and unrelenting. Two million Soviet citizens died during the advance alone. In August, German forces destroyed and circled a great portion of Soviet soldiers in the vicinity of Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. All seemed too good for the Wehrmacht. Yet when they reached the outskirts of Moscow on the 2nd of October, winter had already set in. German troops froze to death in temperatures of minus 42 degrees Celsius, while oil in tanks froze. The German advance was halted after heavy casualties and a Soviet offensive pushed the Germans back 300 kilometers from Moscow. The Germans were unable to formulate any other strategic offensives that year. As always, Hitler was furious. He sacked the head of Army Group Center and blamed his generals for losing the battle when it was his fault as he had used too many German troops in the north and the south and not enough for the attack on Moscow. Immediately in the wake of the battle, January 7th, he planned another offensive, this one in the south. German troops would be withdrawn from Moscow and Leningrad, which would be besieged but not taken, and sent to the south. Hitler's 6th Army had been expanded to become a huge formation, the largest in history, with 300,000 men. 
and this army was to be the striking force of Operation Blue, as the Germans called their southern offensive. Stalin, impressed with his recent victory, had launched another offensive, this one in the centre-southern area of Vorozny. The offensive quickly failed, and many Soviets were encircled. Angry, he refused to let any more Soviet troops into the southern areas, as he believed the Germans would attack Moscow again. He was wrong. Before the offensive began, Hitler said, if I do not get the oil of Maikop and Grozny, then I must end this war. He was obsessed with capturing the oil in the Caucasus, and this led him into dividing the army group center into two, which weakened its strength for Stalingrad. The offensive began on the 7th of May 1942. Soviet organization proved again to be very poor, and the Germans quickly captured Vorozny. From there on, they broke through the Soviet lines to the Don River, and the offensive in the Caucasus began. Although only three out of five German troops were mountain troops, the offensive was a success, and Germany had enough oil to fight on further. On the Don front, the 6th Army broke through on the 28th of June and reached the Volga River, where Stalingrad was. The retreating Soviet 62nd Army stood little chance of survival. The Volga flanks were secure. The Caucasus oil fields were in German hands. All the objectives of Operation Blue had been fulfilled. Yet Stalingrad, a city of 300,000 people, had not fallen. The first time Stalingrad was mentioned as a military objective was in a radio broadcast by Hitler on the 17th of August. By then the 6th Army, 4th Panzer Army and 4 smaller allied armies, primarily Romanian, had started a general advance towards the east. Stalingrad was soon recognized as a major military objective, with its built-up industrial sectors and huge oil deposits. As the German army advanced, the German Air Force bombed the city of Stalingrad on the 23rd of August, causing a huge firestorm. Heavy raids up to the 26th of August killed 40,000 Stalingrad civilians and reduced the city to rum. German airmen were annoyed at the constant bombing raids they were instructed to do. As one said, it was just bombing rubble over and over again. This bombing had the greatest effect of all on the battle itself, as the ruins created enabled a perfect killing ground to use against the Germans by the defenders. Before the battle began on the Soviet side, many civilians, over 200,000, were trapped on the west bank of the Volga because the Soviet authorities refused to let any civilians over. In Soviet law, leaving the city was classified as deserting the motherland to its fate. Finally, on hearing of German atrocities against civilians, the authorities let people cross the river over the Volga. Many barges were then hit by German air raids and thousands died. Rushing in, German troops rounded up 11,000 civilians on the outskirts of the city and proceeded with little resistance to the center square of the city, Red Square. Hours later, the river crossing was also in German hands. In the remaining hours of Soviet control of Stalingrad for that period, the 13th Guards Division, numbering 13,000 men, had been transported over to the West Bank. They were cut off from the rest of their army and attacked by German troops on the 18th of August. Confused and tired, these troops were expected to die out by August 20th, yet not all went according to the German plan. The troops fought bitterly and mostly to the death. Counterattack after counterattack forced the Germans back, and the German troops began suffering heavy casualties. In saving Stalingrad, the 13th Guards Division had to undergo a great sacrifice. Only 129 out of its original 13,000 were alive after the end of the battle. The 13th Guards Division managed to recapture the Volga crossing, and the rest of the Russian army could then pass into the city. For the Russians, there was no land on the other side of the Volga. They would fight to the death in Stalingrad or lose the war, similar to the French in Verdun. Soviet losses were 600,000 at this point, yet morale remained high. Rudit wished for nothing more than to return to the battle. In the city itself, fighting had entered a new era. No battles were ever fought inside the cities of Leningrad or Moscow, so the defenders had to come up with their own new style of fighting. Improvisation was common, 
One man created his own anti-aircraft weapon and managed to bring down three bombers. The Soviet commander of all the units in Stalingrad, General Chukov, soon realized that the primary weapons for street fighting would be the submachine gun, the grenade, and knives or spades. Spades for combat were in such short supply that men often slept with them under their pillows to make sure nobody stole them. The fighting in the city was intense and unpredictable. At one point, a factory is like a layered cake, with the Germans on top, Russians in the middle, and more Germans below them. Time and casualties dragged on into October, where fighting in the major factories became intensified. Finally, once the winter set in, Zhukov began to plan his master counterstroke. Operation Uranus intended to crush the two smaller Romanian armies on the 6th Army flank and then encircle the entire German 6th Army, which contained 300,000 men. Soviet T-34 tanks began to roll over the snow towards the enemy lines on November 11th. Although Italian units put up a fierce fight, the inferior Romanian troops were quickly broken and many surrendered. After being asked by a Soviet interrogator why they did not shoot back, one man replied with sound civilian logic. I did not fire back because I thought it would be a mistake. Within moments, the 6th Army was encircled. Despite utter defeat, over 11,000 German units were still fighting in the city itself until March 7, 1943. The 6th Army had been destroyed. All the ground captured by the Germans in Operation Blue was retaken, and Stalingrad saved, at the cost of 400,000 Soviet lives. It was the most decisive turning point in the war.